Welcome to Anthrodish, the show about food, culture, and identity. I'm your host, Sarah Dubnin. This week, we're exploring the role of design and food systems in anthropology with the super cool Dr. Adam Gamwell. Adam is a design anthropologist, or as he calls it, a design-centered human with international experience in ethnographic and contextual research, narrative media production, cultural analysis, social strategy, and education. He's one of the co-founders of Missing Link Studios, which is a social impact agency that uses data-driven media production to create compelling stories using podcasts, blogs, film, music, web interactions, and data journalism to do so. When he's not producing digital media, he's teaching participatory design research and entrepreneurship in Boston, and is always looking for ways to meld food, design research, and media. This was one of those conversations that really let me learn something in the process as well, which I love. I do a lot of work with uh, communities for my PhD, and never really thought about the ways that design itself functions to shape food systems, or who's involved in designing these spaces. We're looking specifically today at the production and distribution of quinoa in South America, where he did his doctoral research. It's a super fascinating conversation that left me with a lot of inspiration about how we're thinking about designing food systems for our futures and the roles of various people play in it. Here's my conversation with Adam. All right. Welcome to the show, Adam. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Sarah. How are you doing? Good. I'm really excited to have you on. Yeah. Glad to be here. (laughs) So do you mind just starting off sharing a little bit about who you are, where you're coming from, and what some of the major influences um, that shaped your interest around food would be? Yeah, right on. Um, yeah, so, so my name is Adam Gamwell, um, and I am an anthropologist. I also work in the fields of design, uh, and I kind of do design education as well as I am, a, like yourself, a podcaster that has been working you know, with anthropology and, and science communication. You know, I, I run a podcast called This Anthro Life. Um, and, you know, part of the, the work of doing public facing anthropology, we might call it, or, you know, talking to, to wider publics was one of the reasons that I was, I was, you know, also influenced in thinking about what kind of food I mean, I've always been drawn to studying food, uh, and thinking about nutrition and health. And, and so doing podcasting also in a weird way, got me thinking about what kinds of foods do, uh, popular audiences, if we call them that think about what are they interested in? And, and quinoa was one of those, you know, we might call hipster foods here in, in the United yeah. States, probably Canada, you know, um, that, you know, is this craze of, oh, this this crazy great protein and it's super healthy for you. Uh, and it could replace rice and it's gluten-free and it, it had, it had all of the buzzwords. And so part of it was, was interesting to me for that reason. Um, before I got into quinoa, when I was doing my master's research, as well as even in undergraduate, I had the opportunity to go to do archeology span in Peru. And, um, you know, so back in the day, I thought I was going to be an archaeologist, which I think a lot of anthropologists, I find out, yeah. start that way <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I did as well, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> so there you go. Something, I guess it's hands-on, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so so Peru and the Andes have been in my, uh, you know, sort of thinking blood for a long time, you know, since 2013. And, you know, as I, as I went through graduate school, I ended up doing master's thesis work in, in Boston at Brandeis, looking at indigenous social movements in Bolivia. And so I was in the Andes sort of just kept coming back as, as a place to look at. Um, and then as I moved into PhD, which is its own story, uh, I, you know, kind of went a little bit away from doing social movements and, um, you know, kind of, I don't know, revolutionary work, I suppose, uh, to looking at, you know, these, these other subtle sides of how food plays into identity and in indigeneity in this case also. Um, and indigeneity just being like, you know, the sense of something that someone might have about being from a place, you know, what we call indigenous or, you know, first nations people, um, and how that kind of factored into how food gets sold and talked about. And so I actually originally was looking at, um, migrant shepherds that worked between the United States and Peru. And, and it, was, it, was, oh. it was a very weird entree into food because it was like, well, sheep <laughs> usually become food or part of them does, right? There's the, both the wool side and the, the mutton side. Um, but it was actually just a really, really hard uh, field site to get into, which I, I imagine many of us, if you've done field work, can relate to. Like just, you know, getting out there and doing the work is really tricky. And, and uh, you know, it's interesting that the U.S. side was really reluctant to have me uh, come yeah. study migrant shepherds because they've had some bad press before. And I think they thought I was a journalist. Um, mm. And, you know, good luck explaining the difference between a journalist and, and an anthropologist to someone, <laughs> um, you know. <laughs> and 
you know, and so when I was in, in Peru doing research, I went to learn Quechua. That was kind of a, one direction I went to, to that way. I didn't know if I was going to do shepherds or not, depend if people would, if, you know, field sites would take me. And so when I was there, I, I literally uh, stumbled into a quinoa processing plant when I was hanging out in this small town called Ayaviri, uh, which is uh, north of Puno. Puno is the very south of Peru where Lake Titicaca is. And then it's in between Cusco, which people have probably heard of, which is where Machu Picchu is. Um, so this like, little town in between those two cities I was visiting uh, because my host mother at the time had said, I was living in Cusco doing Quechua classes, and she had said, oh, you got to go to Ayaviri if you're going to look at shepherds. So I went to there, and I was looking for shepherds, and I didn't find any, but then I stumbled into this quinoa factory, and I was like, maybe I should study quinoa because they'll talk to me. Um, <laughs> you know, and I don't know. So yeah, so I just kind of like it, it, the pieces sort of came together, and then I was like, all right, we're looking at quinoa um, because uh, the the owner of the business said something that really struck me back then that I, I still remember. Um, it was that, you know, this is not just about trying to, to sell chemo, but this is about building relationships with farmers and with people in the market. This is about how do we connect with people across, uh, you know, different uh, nations and different places, you know, using food. And then that, that idea kind of sat with me because at first I was like, oh, maybe he's like, is that like his business model? That's kind of a interesting business model, but not like yeah. a necessarily a good one for selling anything, you know? Um, anyway, so that was, that's a, a long version of how I got there and then ended up, you know, I met people through him in essence, and that brought me into looking at quinoa for field work. Fantastic. I really appreciate your honesty with that too, because I find, um, you know, so often you're asked that question of how did you come into your research and you're expected to have that very romanticized kind of idea mm. Of your project, and quite often it's it's similar to your case where we're just kind of stumbling into it because of another idea that we had that might not necessarily work out. <laughs> yeah, and then you bring in this you know much more meaningful and accessible project for you as well. Totally, yeah. Can you imagine if they reinvented grant writing so that you could say, actually, I'm just going to make this up until I get it right? You know, <laughs> that would that, be amazing. That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> also a disaster, I feel. But <laughs> yes, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so something I wanted to touch on with you um, is that you work within design anthropology, which mm -hmm. is something very new to me. I'm not, you know, very well versed in it. So how would you explain what this field kind of looks at and researches for those who might not be familiar with it? Sure. Um, so design anthropology, is, as far as I understand it, is uh, it's a kind of interventionist anthropology. And in, so when I say that, what I mean, so if you hear anthropology, right, we know it's it's this you know the comparative study of human societies across time and space using materialities and language and and um, you know our our biology and applied anthropology would then look at that and and find out how are people working through issues or challenges and then then sort of we're applying our thinking processes to help them solve problems and then interventionist anthropology is a step further than that as far as as as, as far as I'm concerned in meaning that what we do is we co-create and co-define problems with people and then help them mm -hmm. solve them. And so, so design anthropology fits in that camp. So to me, it's kind of like if, if you were to put them in a hierarchy of like how, how interventionist they are in people's lives, it's like the furthest step, you know, it's kind of regular academic anthropology applied and then design. Um, and then being that like, this is taking from Scandinavian participatory design is largely where this comes from. And, and what that means is that you bring in the stakeholders, the people that you're designing for, uh, that you're designing with, uh, as part of, you know, the experts they're the people that you're trying to help, you know, define problems with and, and help them solve. And so it, the idea is rather than having sort of an external designer or the old school model of an architect coming and saying, we're going to put a building here and make it look nice. You actually design with the people that are going to inhabit the space that are going to have to use it. And, and you know, and so define the parameters that would be useful for them um, and help them discover things they wouldn't see otherwise, since you're kind of an outsider. Um, and so it's a mix of, of these things, you know, and so, I mean, I've heard other people talk about design anthropology as studying design, which makes sense. Um, you know, but for me, I take it from this angle of participatory design of how do we bring in, you know, if, if anthropologists may have called them informants back in the day or friends or, or people that you work with in the field, communities that you, you study amongst. How do we take them uh, into the fold, as it were, and kind of find out what issues they are dealing with on their terms? And help them define parameters in which you can make actionable steps to help them make a difference or improve whatever the problem is. Oh, okay. This sense? is really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really speaking to me. You use the word co-create. And that's um, in my hmm. own uh, research project, I'm working with um, an indigenous community and we're co-creating knowledge around water security awesome. and water tools. Um, yeah. So the, the whole idea of that, I actually had no idea. Like I truly, when I <laughs> heard design anthropology, I was like, oh, okay, cool. It's like about, you know, designing spaces, but I really like that element of working, you know, with and for communities to create spaces that, you know, reflect their interests and abilities. Mm. 
Yeah, and that's why it's you know it's not a it's not a far cry from anthropology of your as it were. Um, y o u y is that y o r e I guess. <laughs> Back I guess in the so. day, anthropology. <laughs> thinking thinking about like Franz Boas and Margaret Mead and some of the sort of the like the the founding pillars of anthropology. You know, they were known in the United States and around the world. You know, if there was a, there was a cultural or a social problem, you called Margaret Mead and she helped you work through it. Yeah. And and like that's I think is so exciting and and that's what I'm trying to breathe life into that again. You know, and so to me, design anthropology is one way of doing that um and so i i yeah, really appreciate that you're looking at this the co-creation space too because that that is i think i think what the heart of what this is and what the power of design anthropology uh, can be i agreed and i think too especially within you know the time that we're living in i think anthropology has that ability to be this tool that can be useful to kind of go in and help provide these solutions for you know whether it's designing spaces or um, water security issues or whatever um so i like that there are more conversations happening about how we can kind of reframe it to, you know, go back to, or not necessarily go back to the Margaret Mead era, but kind of shape <laughs> it again in a way that's um, <laughs> yeah. helpful and accessible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can t to add to that too, because I think that that's, that's great. And, and, and right on, you know, that uh, the reason I even do design anthropology, this wasn't in, similar to my fieldwork story. I didn't, I didn't go into fieldwork. I started doing fieldwork in Southern Peru in 2015 in, in March or April. And I didn't go into, I didn't move to Peru with the idea that I was going to do design anthropology. Um, I knew that I was interested in doing applied work. I, I wasn't really interested in doing straight up academic research for, for research's sake. Um, and so what I ended up doing was that I also by pure happenstance found an article one time that was written about quinoa and, and how the market was affecting farmers. And then on the bottom of the article, it said, you know, for more information and the site, the, the citations on this piece, like email this person. So I did because there was no citations for some reason um, mm -hmm. and introduced myself. And, and they were like, hey, you know, we, we work, um, we're an international NGO doing um, research on conservation. And we're doing a project, a pilot project with quinoa this year. Would you like to help out? And I was like, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and so really just by this yeah. happenstance thing. But then so what that meant, though, since working with an NGO, and then, they, then I started working with the Peruvian government, the, the NGO is called Biodiversity International. Um, and, you know, and they're, they're a conservation for development nonprofit. And, you know, so I was working with them and the Peruvian government, the Ministry of the Environment, which is actually the newest branch, which is pretty cool that they have that branch. Mm -hmm. um, and I struggled at first to to you know, find my place of like, what does it mean that I'm essentially going to be doing interventionist work with farmers uh, and, you know, basically studying and both measuring and, you know, for an NGO and, and, you know, with the government, like how people make decisions about what kinds of quinoa to grow. And then kind of like yourself, I found this vocabulary uh, of design anthropology. People have been writing about it. There's, there's some really great books we can, we can put in the show notes later too, that yeah, kind of helped frame my thinking and, and then then i realized like that i was like oh this is this is the way that, that i can think about how to be an interventionist uh you know a practitioner in a way that doesn't feel fake in a way that like also honors anthropology and honors and honors the tools that we have of like deep listening um in working with and alongside people you know and speaking alongside them rather than for them um and and, and stuff like that so yeah it was, it was actually this this kind of nice to me too it was this, this serendipitous finding that helped shape you know, what, what would come next or what would end, end up coming out of the research. Yeah. I love that. I think that's, um, I think more often than not, that tends to be from the discussions I've had on, on this show in particular, it tends to be the case that things kind of happen serendipitously to turn into these projects. Um, hmm. yeah. Totally. So, <laughs> um, to kind of go back a little bit, I wanted to, um, think a little bit more about quinoa broadly. Um, mm -hmm. and you had kind of mentioned how it, um, is sort of this hipster superfood sometimes, or it's portrayed that way within media. So I'm curious, um, what makes quinoa such a fascinating and important crop to explore through your design lens or design anthro lens? Yeah, that's a good. It's a good question. Yeah, so so quinoa is is a pretty famous food now, um, partially because of marketing, you know. And so what mm -hmm. made it so interesting as a food stuff to study is that you know the the world of quinoa in Peru is. Uh, at least certainly amongst, you know, indigenous quinoa farmers who I worked with in, in Puno is almost entirely divorced from the, you know, this Whole Foods supermarket hipster model that we that we see here. And when, you know, when I say hipster model, of course, it's just this idea what we might call, uh, you know, people that 
care for the environment on some level and that want to be environmentally conscious and, and would buy similar types of products such as fair trade coffee or, um, you know, other, you know, or single origin foods or something that you can say, there's a picture of the farmer on the back. We got this chocolate from this farmer in Ecuador, you know? And so it has this kind of similar earth friendly, small scale farm appeal. But of course there's this, this interesting disconnect between, uh, you know, how do you get from that small scale farm to the whole foods supermarket? And there's a whole chain and a whole world that, that quinoa goes through, but more importantly, there's this question of scale, you know? And so to me as a food, um, I was really interested in this, this question of, uh, futures and how do people figure out what quinoa is good to grow and for what reasons. And, mm. you know, this is in relationship to, you know, climate change and a changing climate. And like, regardless of whether you have, you know, politicians in the U S you know, saying it's real or not, it doesn't really matter. I mean, one of the things that struck me so deeply when I was hanging out with some, with a farmer and a family of his, he's, he's, he's probably like, he was 65, 70. Um, and we were, we were picking potatoes one day up on his farm on the mountain and he says, look, look down there, Adam, um, you know, we're, we're up high in the Andes, you know, we're, it's two and a half miles up or 4,000 meters. And he, you know, he points down the side of the mountain a little ways and we're looking down. He's like, our farm used to be down there, um, but we had to, we've had to move up the, the, the hill over the past 30 years because bugs that used to not be able to get up this high because of, uh, because of temperature are now coming up the mountain. And so we have to, we're moving away mm -hmm. from the bugs, essentially, and we're going to run out of mountain soon. And that was such this moment of like, whoa, okay, like this is this is not some question of, of whether people are, are saying, you know, there is or isn't climate change, but these farmers have been moving and experiencing it and making sure that their crops and they, their livelihood can survive. Um, so quinoa was entangled in this, like, you know, these, these world markets, you know, these, these global flows of, you know, people wanting to buy quinoa here and being healthy for the environment, healthy for themselves and stuff. But then at the same time, like it, it's an, it's like it points to and shows it's I was gonna say it's an index not to trying not to use jargon <laughs> um, you know but it indexes yep. um you know how uh you know these farmers are understanding and and like literally physically you know concretely demonstrating how they've had to move their farms around mountains um and on top of that too just as, as a total like geek out thing like there's so many beautiful kinds of quinoa like you know we have the you see right. the red the white and the black here in in, in you know northern uh, hemisphere markets, but, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's multiple colors, there's multiple kinds of just the, you know, the white quinoa that you might buy is usually like two or three kinds that will get up here, but then there's so many kinds down there. And so part of it was like this interesting question of like, these are heirloom or heritage varieties that like are niche adapted to these places in the Andes that like they're, they're necessary crops to grow because they're the ones that are most likely going to be able to survive more erratic climate change. Uh, because mm -hmm. they've been so well adapted to these specific climates. But the challenge is those don't have market value. And so it is this question of how do farmers make this choice of what to grow? Uh, but also, again, then what's good for the soil? What's what's good for for quinoa itself, right? So I don't know, there's, there's a ton of stuff that was wrapped up in that. So quinoa is, you know, as is, is, Levi Strauss would say that it's good to think, you know, it gives you something yeah. to think with, I guess. Yes, um, definitely. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, when you're speaking with farmers and, and, you know, kind of exploring their perspectives of what quinoa varieties they choose to grow and produce, do you find that there's a lot of, you know, nuance or complexity in those decisions related to how it would affect like local farmers markets or local production versus the more international scale? Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting thought. So like the two things, like two two kinds of ways that I would approach that question with farmers, because oftentimes like they they spoke about the market as this thing, you know, that was almost personified, right? The market wants this. The market asks for that, mm. um, which I thought was quite fascinating. But the other, so what I did with my research too is that since I was working with, um, you know, NGOs and essentially agronomists or agricultural scientists, I worked with a lot of them too, because they were the ones that were particularly interested in uh working on conservation and having agrobiodiversity and biodiversity be a huge part of people's decision-making processes. And so the cool thing is a lot of these agricultural scientists themselves were also farmers. They certainly grew up on farms and like, and they still spent time and most of them still had farms that they worked on too. Um, and so there was this interesting mix of like these scientists, you know, agronomist folks. There was these other farmers that were kind of in league with the scientists uh, and that they would, you know, do knowledge shares and be talking about these like really kind of awesome varieties. And so part of this, one of the fun parts about research was going to these biodiversity fairs that, that farmers would put on. And they'd have people there that would, you know, just show 
42 different kinds of quinoa, you know, and it was really great to see this, um, you know, just to say like, they're like, Hey man, come on. Cause the, uh, over time I was known as I was, you know, I'm a six foot tall gringo. So I was known as the white guy walking around the, you know, looking at quinoa, <laughs> Very um, noticeable. you know, so my reputation preceded me. You know? <laughs> and so sometimes the people say, Oh yeah. Oh, you're here. Come here. Come, let me show you this quinoa and stuff. And that was actually really quite cool. So there were certain, there were certain farmers that were like certain, like clued in to, to this and they were working specifically on these questions of conservation and, and agrobiodiversity flourishing. Um, other farmers not. And so it's interesting, like, you know, just the point to say, like, there's not a homogenous group, obviously, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Of a community. Um, but yeah, but it was really interesting to see the differences, you know, and and kind of like, this is one of the things that I write about in my dissertation. Um, and but also just to, to worth thinking about is this question of like, when it comes to knowledge, you know, who owns this knowledge about biodiversity? You know, is, is it the farmers that have it? Is it scientists? You know, who, who's like naming the quinoa? Who gets to like claim the correctness of saying, oh, this quinoa is, is this name or this quinoa is that name? Um, I can tell some stories about that later if you want, but yeah, it, it yeah. was an interesting question. So I'm curious, yeah, like um, kind of jumping off of that, um, do you find that there's kind of been power dynamics about who owns that sort of knowledge around quinoa? Um, and has that shifted at all or is that kind of a constant? That's it's yeah, that's a good question. There there definitely is some some tensions there. And it is it does shift, you know. It's also again like what are in this case, you know, what are farmers or you know, agronomists motives in terms of, you know, some agronomists are there to help, you know, agrobiodiversity flourish and they kind of want to, you know, say, all right, farmers, we need to do this anyway, you know, like here, here's why we should do this. And some farmers are like, I, I just want to go to market and sell my quinoa and go home at the end of the day. Other ones say, oh, I, no, I want to have quinoa for my grandchildren and my next generation, you know, and this is, this is mm -hmm. kind of our duty. So there was really a spectrum of people um, in terms of how they would approach it. What was one, one thing that a uh, story that really struck me was that I was, um, you know, this, this goes across a couple of different farmers, but for example, the black quinoa, if, if, if you or any listeners have eaten it here in the United States, um, that kind is called negra coyana. And, uh, that's the kind that gets here to the United States. And so what's interesting is that there is this tension between, you know, basically who has the right to name this kind of quinoa. And so what did, what had happened in this case, I was, I was, you know, visiting a farmer one day and he, he says to me, you know, that the black quinoa, negra coyana, he goes, that that's actually, that's, that's pirated. And I was like, pirated? Huh. How do you how do you pirate quinoa? You know, <laughs> um, and he says, well, so the the indigenous name is called coito, which is Aymara for 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 black, I think, or like durable or hard. And um, so he's saying that this quinoa is, is called coito, and that was just kind of the local name for it. But then over time, the the government took the seeds, and they have they have a, a conservation program in the government. They have a, the National Seed Bank. But what the seed bank also does in t in terms of like collecting seeds is that they will then breed them to make them stronger and then they will then re-release them or in this case resell them. And so then this guy basically said they just like took you know coito cuz it kind of disappeared cuz people were not asking for it in the market and they they took it and they grew it and they essentially just rebranded it, re-released it oh. as as negra coyana. It's it great cuz he actually used the the very colorful metaphor of like when you baptize a child and change its name. Uh, <laughs> You know, and so this is interesting because that, that was like his perspective, right? And, and you know, yeah. so I'm not, I wasn't going to claim, okay, yes or no, this did or didn't happen this way. Uh, but then the other side of it is I then met the farmer, like on my like second or third to last day, of, I was in the field for 18 months, like the second, or, I don't know, second last day, more or less, I was hanging out with a farmer who I, I'd known for like a year and a half at that time. And then he told me, he's like, by the way, you know, that black quinoa that came from me. I'm the one that bred that. And I was like, oh, wow. Whoa. Like, so it was, this is crazy to, to like, you know, again, I don't know if he's telling the truth or not. I'm not going to say he's lying. Um, but, you know, it, it's like you can only you can only verify so far because, you know, people only give you so much information. But so there definitely was the tension between like one farmer saying very prideful, like, yes, I helped save this quinoa and bring it back to the market. Another one saying they pirated it and stole it and like tried to patent it in essence, you know. So there is this really interesting tension of, of get you know what like who owns the who owns the quinoa whose name who gets to name it you know what does the name mean you know and to different yeah. people it signifies different things and i'm curious too especially around the idea of like language and ownership um you know going back to more traditional like is it keshi languages Ke quechua that would be in that or quechua, right yep um yeah so i'm curious like if there's kind of um if if language is used in particular ways i guess in, in the example that you're using it is um, hmm. but if that's something that you're finding quite frequently that there's kind of this, um, almost, I don't know, like I find up here, there's a lot of like decolonization efforts going around 
through language in particular. So I'm curious if that was kind of a current in some of those farmer stories. Hmm. It, it, it's, yeah, I, I didn't see it that much, which that's a good point to, to think about, though. You know, but yeah, obviously, yeah, like this, this farmer was kind of indicating that we need to. He, he wasn't even saying we need to bring Koito the name back, right? Like he was just saying that like they're kind right. of different now. But it's true, like in, in terms of all the kinds of quinoa, not all of them, but a, a good number of them, a good number of the varieties that you would see, they had both an Aymara and a Quechua name. And so what I'm saying that basically what that means is like in, in Peru up into Ecuador. So if you're in the left, you know, the, the Western side of South America in Peru and then up into Ecuador, which is, is north of Peru, um, it's primarily Quechua and, and Quechua, which is the, there's, I think, 21 don't quote me on that language families of Quechua. And then in South Peru, like basically in Puno, there's Quechua and then Aymara and then Aymara goes into Bolivia. So there's kind of two languages. Mm -hmm. So Puno is an interesting place anyway, because it's kind of the cross section of two indigenous language families. Um, and so a lot of quinoa there did have both uh, a Quechua and Aymara name, but sometimes I think, like Koito is interesting because it would be called that in both like, you know, Quechua or Aymara communities, other names um, like Hauru Hirua, which is, I'm sorry, I'm butchering that in Aymara. Um, you know, would be called like Keiwituya in, in Quechua, you know. And so mm. um, it's interesting because nobody nobody seemed to be fighting about the names too much, right? Like nobody was saying this is Haruhiwa or this is Keiwituya. They would be fine saying either one in essence, um, you know, and I might be mixing those names up, but uh, I, don't, I don't speak Quechua or very well. But, you know, but it is an interesting idea. Like there are certainly these these names existed like this, right? And then and certainly farmers would only use those those names, you know. And I don't, to me, that was not an overt decolonization movement. To me, actually, like one of the reflection right. point too is is because you mentioned you see that happening more here in the U.S. or in in Canada and stuff, and you know you know the way that like coffee is like Ethiopian Harar or or you know Yerga Chefe okay, or something okay. like they're trying to yeah, bring yeah. those names in. I'm you know part of me is like waiting for Quinoa to get those names up here too and like oh yeah we're gonna call this Koito we're gonna call this you know Keo Wetulia or something just to like you know. I don't know because yeah, yeah. I'm curious of your experience in that. In that, going backwards, like this kind of decolonization efforts here, what do you think about that? That people call coffee like they're they're using these names like these sort of indigenous names for coffee. Like we don't see it with quinoa yet, but does that? I mean, how does that fit into that that equation in your in your thoughts? Yeah, that's actually a really great question. I was going to ask you about that a little bit with quinoa too, but I I'm so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel very uncomfortable. I don't know about you, um, but especially like as uh, like settler scholar, um, I feel very uncomfortable with that kind of stuff happening because it kind of plays into that idea of like commodifying hmm. these language efforts. Um, and so it kind of to me, it depends on it depends on the product, I'm sure, as well, like where it's coming from, who it's made by the, the steps um, in the food chain or the food production system that it goes through. But I always I often worry about like the intentions behind those efforts, if they're, you know, to kind of save face for a brand or if it's like a truly, um, I don't want to use the word pure, but you know what I mean? Like a truly yeah. kind of genuine effort to, to, to correct and to kind of bring back certain languages and power to those languages. Mm -hmm. through, through the odd mechanism of the market, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it is. Yeah, I I I'm I'm with you there too. I don't really know how I feel about it. It doesn't it doesn't seem right. And that's it's it was, you yeah. know I would joke with people that like oh we're gonna see you know eventually if as quinoa continues uh, that we are gonna eventually see these kind of like you know local names. Um, and the the thing is like there were marketing efforts to do that. Um, like one of the pieces I ran into when doing research um, was there was this this market study done uh, by a development agency that was trying to like you know kind of you know, I forget what they called it, but it was something like brick red quinoa versus just red quinoa. You know, it's given this like, you know, more robust, more low color, some, some, <laughs> you know, something more colorful, but they were trying to find a way that how do we market, you know, these other kinds of varieties of quinoa in new ways for, for new, for, for new, you know, consumers, I guess. I mean, one, one way to think about this, that was interesting that it was happening in Peru um, is, and this is what I wrote about in Sapiens. Um, about this idea of like how do we build a market using gastronomy is that there was a you know some Peruvian chefs and some agronomists um, who I worked with that have been doing work with quinoa for you know 30, 40, 50 years. And uh, so what this 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 agronomist scientist is doing with with a chef is that they are kind of building new recipes. They're taking kind of doing this like Andean fusion. And this comes out of the, there's this really big movement in sort of novo andino cuisine, which is like new Andean, you know, kind of like drawing from the the sexy idea of like, you know, really rich French food and really rich, you know, gastronomic traditions that right. saying Peru has this too. And this is a way that Peru kind of sells itself to the world. 
But what they're they're doing is they're kind of flipping that a little bit on his head by saying, when tourists come to Puno, why don't we, you know, link up? And so the chef works at one of the, the top hotels, the Hotel Libertador, which is like one of the, you know, the, the best, nicest hotels, uh, nice tourist hotels in Puno. And so, you know, he's working with, with this agronomist to come up with new recipes, new fusion ideas, but specifically using and celebrating sort of indigenous or local kinds of quinoa that are not sold in wider markets as a way to build markets for them. But doing mm. that, you know, their hope is in a way of doing it that, A, it's, it's like attractive to, 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 you know, tourists, but then also, uh, you know, that helps support local production and like these local kinds of quinoa that otherwise may get pushed out of the market. So that's a really interesting effort. And it, I really love the, one of the things that, that um, the agronomist's name is Elipio Cañaba, what he does is he, he, he talked about this as um, conquering the stomachs of tourists. So it's like, oh, that's an interesting uh-huh. little, little conquistador method, you know, <laughs> but using, yeah. using the stomach, you know, but that's a really interesting other way of like, you yeah. know, they're, they're intentionally using market commodification um, and gastronomy and like these movements, but as a way to help biodiversity. So I don't, and like, to me, you know, this may be my own naivete, but that seems more pure as it were, like you know, the wrong word to use, you know, but the, like a more yeah. genuine, like try, <laughs> you know, to like, <laughs> Sorry, give, I put that word in. no, it's all good. You know, but like, but it's, it's a more genuine try to, to get uh, people to care in the market, to like respond to and understand and to know, you know, that there's, there's multiple kinds of quinoa and that there's multiple ways of producing it that could be good for local, you know, uh, local, local markets, local farms and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so my next question kind of blends, jumping off of that, it kind of blends that idea of design that you've been talking about and biodiversity. Um, so in using those kind of um, less popularized quinoa varieties, I'm curious how, um, you know, how social identities around quinoa, um, because I know you spoke a little bit in your dissertation about how um, how there are a lot of really interesting and, and kind of complex social identities that quinoa holds in in local spheres versus global spheres. So I'm curious how using those less popularized quinoa varieties might kind of help to um, showcase those identities or kind of shift them in certain ways. Did you find that at all? Yeah, definitely. That's a, that's a great question. Um, you're right. So one of the, one of the, the tensions I hadn't mentioned so far is that, you know, for, for a lot of farmers and a lot of, um, you know, indigenous people in the agricultural sphere in, in Southern Peru. And I mean, I think this is also true as you get into other parts of, of agricultural areas in Peru is that, you know, there is this idea that, you know, one wants to be, I'm putting air quotes, modern and wants to be participating in the quote modern world, um, which means the global economy. And so you, you, you want to listen to and respond to the market and that both involves production as well as consumption right that like in order to participate in the in the contemporary world you know it's you need to buy a tv and you want to have a radio and you want to have uh you know white flour starchy foods is one of the common food things um you know but then also production of that is like oh well the market wants this kind of quinoa this kind of potato so we'll produce those so we can sell them um and buy it itself like you know we have to say that that is people's choices and i'm not going to you know evaluate saying you're making a good or bad choice on your in your life because that's not my place to do so but um there is of course that raises anthropological antennae to be like wait a minute you know you don't don't choose the western diet because it's shitty you know sorry um, right. it's not good <laughs> you can curse you can bleep me out if you need it's but, fine, um, don't worry. <laughs> um you know but but there's there's this notion that like it catches our ears in a, in a different way and then but the flip side of this in peru is that like if you are growing these biodiverse kinds of quinoa or you're like choosing or are, are, are unable to participate in in consuming you know white flour foods and, and and you know dressing in a you know more quote modern way versus indigenous dress you know or more like urban versus rural um that these these are like you know uh categories that people then place on people saying you know you're you're less you're, you're you know you're more backwards you're more you know big figure racist term and you, you can apply it there and and so quinoa like fit into this equation too, because it was like growing indigenous kinds of quinoa, these local varieties, you know, on one level didn't have this, this didn't have the prestige value of like, I'm participating in the global market, right? It's more like, oh, I can't right. afford to get that kind of quinoa. So I'm going to grow this other stuff. Um, however, what's been really interesting is with efforts like this gastronomy movement of, of, you know, sort of reinventing quinoa or even the idea of conservation as this. Uh, you know, essentially like superhero move that you are protecting the future and you're making decisions that are actively fighting climate change. 
um, it has changed the prestige of this local these local varieties, right? It doesn't it doesn't magically change everywhere, and it certainly changes ironically with people that are still talking in global environments. You know, the more rural you are, you may not, um, you know, either have access to this kind of information or these kinds of quinoas, or you know. But the good thing is that you know I, I saw that a lot of agronomists are really really working hard to get as far out you know off the roads as they can to visit different communities. Um, and see who is interested, you know. So I mean, I ended up visiting probably around fifty communities, which is a lot, like you know, over over mm-hmm. a year. Um, I worked more intensely with about ten of them, but still, you know. But seeing that, like, it's was, it was very interesting to see that a lot of um, agronomists were making, you know, deep the ones that were working in conservation in this regard were working make made deep, deep efforts to go visit a lot of different places and, and sort of bring this knowledge up because it did change the you know quinoa had this interesting capacity right to hold both this you know backwards. You know, poor person's food is what it was known as for, for years, for decades. You know, really, I mean, the, the, the crazy history, I don't mean to jump too far back in time, um, is that, you know, since, you know, basically since the, the you know, 500 years ago at the, the time of, you know, Spanish invasion or conquest or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, quinoa was over time denigrated and, and treated as this peasant food, as the poor person's food. Um, and it was, you know, replaced with quote, prestige crops like wheat and barley and, and oats and stuff that were brought over from, from Europe. And, you know, this is kind of the, you know, on one level too, I say, well, this is the Andean, you know, joke on you guys is like, this, this is actually the real, this is the real protein powerhouse. This is the real, yeah. actually good food um, that you guys were, you know, too stupid to, to realize because you're, you know, blinded by racism and X, Y, Z, but that's 500 years up until now. But the thing is like, that's really just changing in the past 50, 60 years, which is crazy to think about, you know, it's taken yeah. 450 years uh, to really start seeing a change. And part of that is because I think nutrition, you know, became a more understood vocabulary. Like people are not, you know, I don't hear farmers talking about amino acids too much. But the crazy thing is I do hear them talking about that. And that's not something I expected farmers to be discussing with, Yeah, me. you know? And so that that's says true. some knowledge is getting, getting through and like, but that's then showing that there is a prestige with this food is healthy. You know, one, one of the other pieces real quick that I saw with this is that a lot of farmers and agronomists too in, in Puno were talking about that, like they're like 30 years ago, we didn't have diabetes. And I was like, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And they, they also said we didn't have cancer. And I'm like, that's even more interesting, I, you know, but, um, you know, at least colloquially, you know, they didn't. And, um, and meaning that as people's diets changed, as things became more globalized and people were eating more pastas and cookies and sugar and, and white flour and refined foods, that they've seen a spike in diabetes and cancer. And, and so a lot of farmers did then talk about our foods, our foods being quinoa and potatoes and, and the native varieties of potatoes too. Um, you know, all the native varieties of food that grow in, in the Andes um, are the healthy foods in that like they've actually been, you know, nobody was like, nobody said they were tricked. It's just more like they realized that they've seen health declines, um, in, in, you know, in their own eyes, you know, realizing once these diets started changing. So there is definitely this like, this knowledge that's around this area, right? That is like both, you know, we're getting scientific information, realizing that amino acids are great for like you know, the quinoa's amino acid profile is, is a, a quote, perfect protein, um, which is awesome. But then on top of that too, they're just saying colloquially, we've seen our health decline in the past 30 years because our diet has changed. And so that, the, you know, it's really interesting to see that, that there's, I don't know, it's, it's operating on so many levels. Yeah, and the scale is kind of overwhelming sometimes to think about how <laughs> yeah. it affects on the, yeah, I'm sure for you, especially writing it all up. Mm. Um, and it's interesting kind of coming back to that story that you're sharing about the farmer who had to relocate um, further up the mountain or around the mountain, mm. that, you know, these are issues that they're witnessing on a day-to-day basis. And then these discussions around health and nutrition are kind of becoming more accessible or like more commonplace as yeah. well as seeing these physical changes and this, you know, having this kind of environmental knowledge as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and actually, to, to, to also add into your point, because I realized you asked also about design. So thinking about all of that, and like the reason that design is, is a good framework for me to think about this anyway, um, or design anthropology specifically, is that because what we're seeing now, and this is just, this is again how I sort of framed what I was writing about, is there's two levels. One is that looking at farmers and scientists as, as cultural brokers that work between all these different knowledge sets, these different social classes, these different ways of approaching food production and consumption. Um, but then, so design in this case is how do people bring about desired futures? How do they, you know, put in place the pieces, the ideas, the systems, whatever it is, like, you know, uh, how do they mm-hmm. sort of assess their current situation and then say, actually, I want, I want that future. I want my health to be better. I want, you know, to survive environmental collapse. I want to participate in the market, whatever that is. 
And so I approach these as design problems, right? And so it's, it's kind of saying if we came together and a farmer talks to about, you know, we have health problems here, we have, we're losing conservation here, we're losing, you know, local varieties to the market. So this, this then, you know, rather than saying, oh crap, you know, we're screwed. It's like, no, why don't, why don't we take this as, as a, as a challenge and understand what are the variables that people are trying to deal with and how they're, how they're approaching it. And then what, what would it look like to start thinking about solutions together? Um, and that's, that's kind of where design came in, in that piece. Right. So, um, from, from your experiences and work there and kind of like having that perspective, um, what sorts of solutions do you think would be, um, like positive and also like realistic solutions to help within the ideas of like agrobiodiversity and, and sustainable food, food futures. I always trip on that. It is really hard to say food futures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that, I mean, that, that's a good, you know, that's a, that's a whole, whole question for the universe. Um, like, so some of the things yeah. that, that we found though, so basically like working, I, you know, so I, I kind of approached this from a couple different levels. One of them, as, as we mentioned, was the gastronomy project of how do we then like, you know, essentially use tourist stomachs and the question of taste to, uh, increase the marketability in this case and demand for local varieties of quinoa. Like, of course, yes, obviously I understand that down the road can have its own problems of monocropping. Um, mm -hmm. and monocropping being that you only grow one kind of variety versus, versus a bunch of different kinds. Um, which, and the idea there was like, normally there was this kind of, uh, uh, a practice called chakru in, 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 I believe it was Quechua. Um, forgive me if it's Amara, but the idea is that like farmers would sow multiple kinds, multiple, um, varieties of quinoa in the same plot. That way the strongest ones can survive and they would and crossbreed too. It was interesting because only until when we started doing scientific you know, agronomic research in quinoa, it was when quote unquote purity in this time, it makes sense, works genetic purity in terms of not mixing together the different varieties. So you can tell what's what, um, this wasn't really an issue, you know, prior to sort of scientific classification in this regard. It doesn't mean that quinoa wasn't classified because it certainly was, but you know, genetics is a very different way of classifying information than is by, right. you know, a color typology or even taste. Um, so one, one solution we're seeing is this kind of gastronomy question of like, we could still do chakru and they, they even like talked about using chakru and doing a, a, doing a chakru garden at the hotel. So people could see, this is how you mix quinoa together. This is why it makes better quinoa. It's like, it was cool. Like it's this mix of both demonstrating and doing it. So that's, that's one yeah, model right. I saw of like, you know, putting farm, like literally farm to table. It's like, oh, the farm is right there out the, out the window. <laughs> um, you know, on the, on the, with, with bioversity and, and the Peruvian government, like this is a, actually a paper I'm working on with them now. We did, we did this series of experiments that are, I mean, it's out of the field of behavioral economics, which was new to me. And, you know, I'm still learning about this field, but in this case, we did a series of experimental games to understand how farmers made decisions of what kind of quinoa they would want to grow based on incentives. And so this is something that Bioversity has been doing for, for different groups around the world. So this is not, you know, this was not like the first time they, they'd run this sort of experiment. Um, and, but it was, it was the first time I'd done it. So it was interesting for me, but what, what we're looking at and finding out was, it was, does, uh, you know, the closeness of family members and friends in, as a social network in a village, in a community, uh, make a difference of how likely people are to grow quinoa, essentially like how risk averse are you? Like, are you willing to grow quinoa that doesn't necessarily have a huge market value? Um, you know, if you have people near you that will support you. And then on top of that, if you got paid to grow quinoa, that was for conservation versus market. Like for example, if the government paid you for, for indigenous varieties versus market varieties, um, you know, what would it take to do that? And so that was really interesting too, just to kind of get the sense of, and that was a very different way of doing experiments for an anthropologist, right? Cause normally we are doing participant yeah. observation, asking questions. Uh, and so it was a, like an awesome learning experience for me. Uh, and so you know, and that was this interesting idea of, of finding out, like, is there that much of a difference between people's decision-making processes using these experiments uh, to tell, you know, if they would or would not grow, you know, market varieties or or uh, local varieties based on, you know, getting paid to do it in essence. Um, and so that's like, that's not the answer to the question, but that's sort of like, this This is ways that people are, are, are trying to figure out um, what would it take to get people to want to, you know, to choose on a larger scale to grow local varieties of quinoa, like for the idea of agrobiodiversity, right? Um, and I think mm -hmm. just like maybe a third, like large piece that's important is emphasizing to the people that are growing the quinoa, primarily farmers, that like this is, there is a prestige, there is a, like both a, a social power, but as well as like a, a you know, a environmental power of, uh, you know, 
adapting to environmental change versus market change, you know, and like realizing that, um, you know, you're not backwards by any means. Like you're almost, you know, what I would say is you flip it, you're more forward thinking because you are adapting varieties of quinoa. You're adapting your, your farms to these more erratic cycles of environment, which is not good, also not your fault. But by doing this, like you are making more robust crops that are more locally adapted, more niche adapted, that are more likely to have you be able to survive, right? That have the crop be able to survive. Um, and so part of it is just, I mean, I don't know, campaigns that are that are just saying like, this is this is good. Like this is, this is a good way. Like monocropping is not good. Um, it doesn't really help anybody except the question of scale. Uh, and, um, you know, I know feeding a lot of people is important. It's a, a different question. But, um, you know, when you're looking at a local scale of farming, it's like, you know, sort of helping this message be out there that like this is actually you know, quite a good, and, and, and like, to me, it's, it's a point of pride. Like you can, you can demonstrate and celebrate your knowledge that you like, you know, the land, you know, these crops, um, and they're part of your family, you know, and that's, that's, I think really something powerful that a lot of farmers that worked in biodiversity were really quite adamant about, like they're, they're, they're very proud to show, uh, the super amount of varieties that they, they grew and they knew about, and they could like rattle the names off and where they came from. Um, and that was really powerful. So I don't know, that's, that's three super broad, <laughs> Maybe we can we can survive <laughs> if we do some of these answers. No, I think, I, I mean, yeah, I think, again, very honest answers because those are, you know, these big, big questions that have so many different stakeholders invested in, you know, in providing and, and working towards these solutions. So I like that you kind of have all these different lenses and spheres to look at how how these kind of futures can come about through, you know, um, different sorts of or at different sorts of scales. Um, exploring that sort of yeah i mean it, you know it's i mean when it comes to the future that's all we can do i guess on, on one level right it yeah. reminds me yeah. tim tim ingold an anthropologist you know one of the things that he talks about because he he's written a, a bunch about design anthropology um oh, he okay. talks about this notion of correspondence meaning that you know when you're trying to to you know essentially design a desired future this is not about you know going there into the, into the future and like saying we're going to put these we're going to scaffold this this stuff in place and then it's going to magically happen this way but he talks about this really interesting idea of essentially running out ahead of events and pulling them along a certain trajectory, um, which mm -hmm. is, I think, a really pretty metaphor um, for mm -hmm. thinking about this kind of work, right? You do have to think of these large scales, you know, and these these like fairly big spheres of, of, of interaction that, that things go through so that, you know, you can kind of run ahead and say, okay, if we want to head off at the pass, you know, biodiversity loss, like let's approach it from these, I don't know, some of these like the bigger realms, right. And see what pieces we can then run ahead of them and, and, and pull them out in the direction that we want them to go. So, um, I guess just to kind of, as we start to close down the interview, I'm curious because, you know, this is a lot of what you're speaking to was your doctoral research and your dissertation. So how have you kind of, or where are you now in terms of, you know, your, um, you're now a doctor, um, what kind of roles have you taken on and how have you used design anthropology to kind of explore different sorts of projects and experiences? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. This, this is, this is where my, myself feels a little schizophrenic, um, uh -huh. you know, because I, uh, not maybe not that I didn't during field work, but, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> but so, so since, since I came back from the field in 2016, um, in, the, in October. And so I've been back for, you know, not quite three years now, but since that time, you know, I finished writing up dissertation and I finished that in 2018. So it still took two years to write a long process. Um, yes. Congrats. Though. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, but within that time frame, I, I was really, really d drawn to the design side. Like I have, I, I, I can teach anthropology 101. I can teach you specialist classes. Like I had that down pat um, you know, as, as most graduate school students do get, you know, towards the end, whether you're doing a teaching assistantship or you end up teaching classes or stuff, I, 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 I'd both taught anthropology, um, for a few years in between masters and PhD, as well as then, um, during PhD for a little while. And then when I came back from, from field work, I was really interested in the design side, right? You know, so I found this design anthro and there's, there's no, I mean, I'm not going to go get a master's in design anthropology when I'm getting a PhD in anthropology, because yes. it's just more school and that's crazy. But, um, but so I wanted to, I wanted to get the design side down a little bit more. And so I joined, uh, like, like you do professional association, the AIGA, which is the American Institute for graphical arts, uh, which is just now a design, you know, professional agency. It's, it's like the American anthropological association for designers. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I got to know design communities a little bit more here in, in the U S um, in Boston where I live. And, you know, so I joined them and helped 
doing programming with them just to you know see you. and they were really quite receptive and quite excited about the idea of a design anthropologist because it was like this new interesting weird you know what is that uh yeah you know and and so they were you know quite welcoming to me which is nice and so then through that i've actually ended up um teaching a bunch of random classes you know doing some adjunct teaching um you know so i teach design research and design thinking and and i do a senior seminar class called design discourse which is essentially what i call ninja anthropology which is teaching designers uh, about their own perspective and how their choices you know have cultural impact and how to think culturally sensitively um nice you know which i really love because to me like that's that's to me where the real work that we need to be doing as anthropologists is like i can go teach anthropology on one shore but a ton of everybody does that right and so um we need anthropologists out in the trenches as it were in other things you know so i i you know i teach th those classes i've been teaching those for about three years now and then i have also hopped around and uh i last semester and uh was it fall 2018 i taught uh, at a college in a master's program which was awesome to teach master's students in uh civic media design and we did oh. we did a class in participatory design methods which i loved um you know, a working with master students because they were they want to be there. <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> you know, and they weren't willing to put the work in. But the class was framed around working with community partners to help them, you know, co-design uh, solutions to problems that we figured out together. And like that, like really, I was like, this is this is the work. This is it. You know, uh, because anthropology just gets to be done. I don't have to walk around thinking, oh man, how do we make anthropology? You know, how do how do we like do the work? How do we get it applied? You know, we just talk to each other and and. You know, don't ever do anything, and I'm like, no, I'm I'm doing the work. It's it's like it was interesting. The conversation changed, um, not between me and other anthropologists, but like because they would still ask these questions of how do we get anthropology out in the public. I'm like, just go do it. Just uh, go do it. Yeah. You know, like stop <laughs> stop talking about it. You know, and, and like because that's that's I've definitely you know I I'm now very tired of that conversation of like how do we get anthropology mm -hmm. to be public? It's like just go do it. Like stop asking the question. Like you know. Um, and for me, that's been teaching design in other schools. Also, as we said before, you know, I've been doing this anthro life for six years, which is crazy. Yeah, um, that mean, like that in is, like yeah, really in, in like in podcast years, I think that means I'm elderly. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, but uh, I, I, you know, so last year, I, you know, got to do. I had this great, great honor. I was asked by the the AAA to do a, a podcast series with them in the Smithsonian. Um, at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival last year. So I got, I, you know, this really awesome, awesome, uh, you know, activity thing we got to do. But so basically I got to go to DC and just put my anthro hat back on and like recorded nine hours of audio with people at the, at the Folklife Festival. And then we just ended up cutting it into a, uh, you know, five episode miniseries. It was, it was the most work I've ever done on audio stuff, but it was also one of the most rewarding projects I've ever done. Um, and so, and that was cool as premised entirely on cultural heritage and how do people like make lives in, in worlds defined by migration. So it really took a mm -hmm. lot of what I did in field work in terms of like understanding how people, you know, do global as it were, and like do, do local at the same time. And, you know, this was just a series of, of, you know, kind of interviews with people and, and framed around, you know, episodes of music and art and, and, um, and clothing and weaving and, and language and identity and stuff. And, you know, that this kind of work, too, I just love I've really, really kind of dug my feet into doing uh, audio production for good, as it were. And so I founded also Missing Link Studios, which is now houses this anthro life. I realized that, you know, when I did the Smithsonian project. I was like, this is this is this anthro life because I'm that. But at the same time, this is bigger than just this is you know not just TIL. And so mm -hmm. I realized it was time to make kind of a bigger house because I also the thing is I want to now help other people make audio, uh, you know, using anthropological thinking and, and skill sets and do and do you know, audio and media production for good. Cause I love that side of it because that's something very concrete that I'm, I've gotten good at that I love doing. Um, and so, you know, so missing link has now become this, this, my, my little hub, uh, that I'm, I'm trying to grow and that. So if, if people are listening and they want any audio production or work, like hit me up, you know, but, but this, this idea of like, what does it mean to help people use audio for good? And like essentially to do audio scholarship, right. To like, how do we do like you're doing with anthro dish? Like, how do we bring these voices and this kind of anthropological formats out to, to the wider public, you know, um, I mean, on a, I actually don't even say the word public, sorry. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't talk about public anymore as, as you and I, we kind of mentioned before we started too. It's like, we like, we do this for, for, you know, everybody. And yeah. when you, when you do that and that's your goal, like public, the word goes away. Like you're not trying to say, how do we be more public? It's more like, nope, just like, just do the work, you know, and people exactly. will respond or they don't. And if they don't, then you realize it's not working, you know? Um, anyway, I don't know. So that, that's kind of a rambly thing, but yeah. so there's been, there's been a lot of different developments that like have been not specifically anthropological, but they are entirely informed by anthropology. And like, and the thing is like my core, and this is what I, I say to people now, anyway, it's like, 
my core, I'm an anthropologist, you know, like I will go teach design, I'll do media production, but anthropology is how I approach everything. Um, and that's never going to go away. And that I think is the real power of anthropology, right? That's the real power of our work and our, mm-hmm. and our mindset and our method, you know, uh, is that we can take this and put it anywhere and it's, and it's still anthropology, you know, like I'm not going to be a journalist. I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm a podcaster, but I'm not a journalist. I'm an, I'm an anthropologist, you know, um, like yourself in, in that, I think there's, there's some power in that. Like, and we just, just do it and own it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I always kind of, especially being in that stage of my PhD where I'm gearing up to finish, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what does it mean to have that? And, and does that mean that I have to stay within this sort of framework? And I've really kind of come to appreciate that no matter what, like that is teaching you as it was with your experience um, in Peru and learning about quinoa, you know, you're, you're building this skill set that you can apply to virtually anything that you want to and, and kind of come in with that framework as an anthropologist, which is really powerful in certain circumstances for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. And there, there, of course, as you know, will be pushback in certain areas, but at this point, I say mm-hmm. screw it. Like whatever. Like I don't, you know, push back if you want to. Like then I'm not going to talk to you. We're not, not going to work together, and that's okay. <laughs> you know, because um, there are, are people that will, like yourself, and so like we're doing fine. There's two of us now, so <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? We're getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so oh, one other thing I wanted to kind of touch on when you were talking about the public or like the quote unquote yes. public, I I find it really kind of it is um. It brought me back to when you're talking about how farmers would use the term market sort of like as a personified idea. Mm, yeah. And I think that we kind of tend to use the public, quote unquote, as anthropologists, as this like, you know, anthropomorphized idea that's yep. not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, 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 <laughs> that, that, That's a good point. Yes. The yeah. public wants this. You're like, what, what, who? who? <laughs> yeah, totally. That's a great, that's a great point. <laughs> um all right so adam where can people find um your work online if they want to check out some of your writing your podcast your audio all the kind of cool stuff that you've got going on uh, yeah so uh my personal website is gamwell.design my last name g-a-m-w-e-l-l um, dot design and that's that's where it's a link to like basically everything else that i do and you know it's a bit about me and that stuff so it's got links to writing and podcast work um missing link studios you can check out missing link dot studio i have very difficult to remember <laughs> urls no dot no dot coms if i can help it and the, like this hanthor is is you know I've been the podcast forever that's linked on on both those websites also um awesome. that's the main place twitter gamwell is is my name you can find me on there um yeah i mean so twitter is my main thing i, I otherwise don't i i basically can't stand facebook um, but <laughs> Fair. you have to find me there. We can, but yeah, it was a, you know, basically <laughs> gamble, gamble that designer missing link that studio is, is where you can find me these days. But yeah, I, I'm always, always up for conversations with people to, to talk more media stuff, more design work, more anthropology. Um, yeah, th- those are, those are my digital homes. Or if I'm in Boston, you can come find me here too. That's a good place to be. <laughs> Perfect. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for coming on and sharing all your knowledge and experience. This was awesome getting to talk to you. Yeah. It's been, been a huge pleasure. Thanks. And, and um, thanks for letting me talk. That was Dr. Adam Gamwell, design anthropologist. I've included the links to his websites and Twitter if you'd like to learn more about him in our show notes and on my website. And if you're in the market for some new summer podcasts around anthropology, be sure to check out his podcast, This Anthro Life, which I've also included on my website and show notes below. Let us know what you think about the episode on social media. You can find us at anthrodish.com or on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at Anthrodish Podcast. And if you're loving Anthrodish, subscribe and leave us a rating and review on iTunes. It really means the world to us and helps support us in a small but powerful way. Music and sound editing for the episode was done by Lucas Wojcicki. Anthrodish is produced in partnership with the American Anthropological Association. Thank you so much for tuning in as always, and we'll see you next time.